in this video, uh, which is part of the uh, EORIC, uh, Open EORIC training course which we run, you're going to see Dr. John Knight and Carlos Bachara on a cadaver uh, showing certain principles, endarterectomy of the neck, parachute technique, preparing the iliac artery, in addition to how to set uh, retractors and actually create the exposure. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, let me, let's just, okay, so we've, uh, so as we were showing you in the last scene, we've taken our Omni retractor, hook it over to the right side of the table, we've got our arm up here to the top, we've made attention to put these arms in a position where you have enough room to retract, so you don't want them too tight. Yep. Uh, you don't typically need a bottom piece on an abdominal uh, operation only. If you're doing thoracoabdominal, you usually have to put uh, uh, arms up from above and below so you've got a full retraction. But for an abdominal, you can usually get away just with the uh, single piece. Now, as I showed you before, what I usually do is take three, we talked about those three laps. We anchor in behind the cecum. We circle around the cecum and appendix and terminal uh, ilium. Take the small bowel mesentery completely to the right and then continue on across with a, an overlapping lap so we've now created an s-shaped barrier to the divide the, to the in, to the pieces of the abdominal content that we don't want part of our operation that is the the right colon the small bowel and the transverse colon now what i do usually is at this point once i've set up my laps i will try based on to assess whether there's sufficient abdominal wall to pack the bowel in the belly and i usually do at this point pack it in the belly so, and again, I don't have to change anything because I'm right where I was before. And she's, this is a little bit tight here, but it does work. So, as we were talking about before, the two uh, vector forces that we're trying to apply here are to the right side and to the head. So, Carlos is going to put on the malleable over here on the right side and come as high as you can toward the renal vein. Yeah, slide up a little more and then just lock it right in there. Perfect. Okay. Now I'll hold that. That's the one thing I don't really like about the Omni, it's kind of a two man operation. All right, that's locked in. And then we're going to take this second device here. And this one, again, we're pulling basically straight north. And this is a, we're kind of compromised because this patient's pretty thin. Let's just do this. I'm going to take that just a little bit looser and bring it right up there. The main thing we're trying to do here is, you can, that'll be okay like that. The main thing we're trying to do is create this corner because the hardest thing to get to is the right renal artery above the renal vein. So we're creating retraction to the right and to the north. Now, if you've got another malleable, we can overlap a malleable here. If you got it, yeah, that uh, bladder blade doesn't wall, work yeah. too well. If there's another big malleable, I don't know if there's one over there uh, or not. But uh, over this that's this perfect. Wall. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, so we got another malleable here that overlaps like that. Well, let's see if you can get this beggar on here. Yeah, it's going to get in there eventually. Okay, you can. Lock that, yeah, and just, just actually just put it like that so there it's go. parallel. Yeah, there you go. That's just, I just want to demonstrate this way and then we can do another way. Man, It'll ever tighten up. Yeah. There you go. All right, so now we've got really nice exposure. I usually, and everybody's got a little technique, but I just want to show you mine. I usually take a cannonball and I stick a cannonball up under the, under the left side and then I'll usually use a bladder blade here so I can take that and that gives me nice exposure and push down on this so that it, so I'm not trying to create a deeper hole. And then my last cannonball or retraction would be down on the sigmoid colon. And again, with uh, individual retractors on each of those. Uh, a lot of hospitals, of course, you know, they won't let you uh, put a non-marked towel in the belly. Yeah, that's right. Because that, somebody kind of, has had a retained uh, foreign object, and as soon as they yeah. do, so I mean, typically, you're the, I mean, for I'm talking about infrarenal, your your landmark for dissection, you need to see the left renal vein that marks your, you know, most. Watch this hand. Uh, yeah. That marks more your um, uh, cephalad dissection. Uh, obviously, need to be higher, uh, and then also, you know, your bifurcation. It also depends where you want to go. 
And now, once you start exposing, you're going to be to the right side of the uh, IMA. And the reason for that is, you know, try to avoid damaging the um, uh, I, um, IMV and also the IMA. So you want to go a little bit to the, so I kind of know it's here. I'm going to go to the side of it. And then you're going to expose all the way. Uh, again, you know, spread, cut, spread. Now the vein, you have to be careful. And that's when you're going to decide, are you going to, you know, cut the vein, or are you gonna preserve the vein? Is that the vein? Mm -hmm. That's vein. Here's gonadal yeah. vein. You yeah. see. So, so that's the decision you need to make. You know, usually you know that ahead of time. I mean, again, if you, uh, you know, like we always say, never compromise exposure. So, um, uh, so I usually have no problem taking uh, taking the vein. You know, again, this is a gonadal vein. Posterior lumbar is going to be somewhere here, and your all further out. And uh, this could be a good plane here where you're going to take it, you know, um, mobilize it some more. And usually for vein, don't grab a little bit because you tear it. You want to grab a good piece of it and then so you can dissect it. So, um, yeah, and as with all arterial dissections, the closer you are to your target artery, the less likely you're going to hurt something that you don't want to hurt. It's like the lumbar renal lumbar artery or, or <laughs> lumbar or something. That? Oh boy, I, I don't know. Plant. It yeah. may be. It could be the renal artery yeah. or, or a branch. A branch, yeah. She's yeah. little. There's the leg. That's a left renal artery. Yeah. So this is probably an accessory right renal artery yeah. that we have uh, yeah. intentionally uh, <laughs> transected in order to improve the exposure of the yeah. <laughs> renal arteries. Now let's uh, let's see if we can get up here and find that. Uh, a lot of times there's just stuff in the way. I guess that's the SMA, that's right? That's probably there, SMA, yeah. Coming down. That's interesting. Yeah. Should be right. Yeah. Sticking up right there, I think. There we go. Yeah. So it's kind of this is a good picture of the SMA right here. I think you can see that. Here's SMA, here's renal vein, here's the left renal artery, here's the right renal artery, is there right back I'm here. My forceps are at the top of yeah, that. That's right the renal artery. And this was an accessory right renal artery below yeah. that. You can see how close the renal arteries are to the SMA. And in a patient like this, where the renal arteries are at staggered levels, you might well decide to put a clamp between them. It'd be a mm -hmm. typical scenario for an infrarenal uh, repair. Uh, it's not uncommon to have these uh, staggered levels, and you know that from fenestrated graphs. So sometimes putting a clamp right there is a, a really nice option, as opposed to having to get fully above the right renal when your SMA is really close. Still, even in this case, where you can see there's a little bit of the space above that right renal artery, you could put a suprarenal clamp on above both renal arteries and still be below the SMA. And that's my personal, I prefer to do that. Uh, some people like to, when this kind of a setting, go above to the supraceliac clamp, but I think uh, that's, uh, again, a surgeon's choice, depending on what your experience and most recent disaster was. Yeah. So again, got a good picture of the uh, SMA, renal vein, right renal artery, the left renal artery, infrarenal aorta, inferior right. mesenteric artery, yep. and the aortic bifurcation. There you go. And, you know, when you're dissecting on the, you know, the iliacs, two things you want to watch for. One is the ureter, and the other one is, you know, you don't want to make, you know, you don't want to do like circumferential dissections. You'll injure your uh, iliac veins, and that could be a disaster. Uh, try to fix and control it. So, so again, for a vertex surgery, just want to expose enough to do your operation. I think here I see you the can internal. see the ureter right here. There you go. The left ureter up here. Just you know, it's yeah, usually right at the bifurcation. Yeah, which is there. And we can look over here. I don't know if we can see it on this side. Let's see I think I see ureter there. here. No. Possible. It's probably somewhere right up in there. I don't think I've 
managed to tear it yet. Mm, it must be pulled kind of right yeah. over in there. Or I don't see it. Yeah. Honestly, I don't see it right I now. I think we haven't shown this is the K-Box show. Maybe see. And you can see where May Thurner syndrome occurs, right where the right renal artery, I mean the right uh, iliac artery, compresses the left common iliac vein. You can there see you there's left common iliac vein and the right common. With one good scissor, if we had one. Okay. Now we've transected the aorta. Now one of the things that sometimes is a problem is that there's little short lumbar branches down here. And some of these lumbar branches will tether that back wall of the aorta and you can see what's happening here. The plaque is separating from the wall of the aorta and that if, you, if you're not aware of that and you start to take these back wall bites, all you'll get is plaque and you won't have gotten bites into the strength layer, the adventitia. Also, as in this particular case, you can see there's a fair amount of calcium in this vessel. Calcium is going to prevent your suture from penetrating. So we're going to have to do a regional, a little local endarterectomy here in order to provide ourselves a, a tissue that we can sew. So we're just going to pluck these, this calcium out. And because this is going with the direction of flow, we don't really have to worry about the sections developing. All we're trying to do is create a space for our sutures uh, to be able to be uh, effectively penetrate the aorta. I've never seen the aorta so weak after an endarterectomy that it wouldn't hold a stitch. Do want to kind of make sure there's no odd flaps down in the aorta. But that will work well now for our proximal anastomosis. Now anteriorly it feels like we've actually got some calcium here that we're going to have to work on as well. Because uh, calcium is bad in two ways. One is it's sharp enough that it can cut your suture. And it is also, because it's a rock, it will keep the suture line from pulling up tight and you'll wind up with bleeding at the site of some of these large calcified plaques. So, Generally, if you really have heavy plaque, you need to go ahead and uh, take that calcium out before you try to do your anastomosis. Now, if it's, if it's soft plaque, it's perfectly fine to leave it in place. But if you really have bone-like calcium, and you can see it here is truly bone-like, uh, you really do need to get this plaque out or you will not be able to sew it. Go ahead and do that endarterectomy. And now we've got a sewing ring that's uh, suitable for our graft. And as I said, I've never seen one of these that was so weak that you couldn't, that it wouldn't hold stitches, but you certainly have to be a little bit cautious uh, as you sew it that you don't tear the aorta when it's relatively uh, weak. All right, so that's what we're going to sew to here. Now, next thing we want to do is we want to prepare our distal aorta. We don't want the body of this graft to have to sit on top of the distal aorta because it'll cause it to stand up in the air and increase our risk for an aorta duodenal fistula. So what I want to do is I'm going to take a little segment of distal aorta out. You can see here's a lumbar I'll need to ligate right here. I can go ahead and cut that now and I cut the other side. And then I usually take a little segment of this out and I usually taper this at a slight angle so that I now can over sew this distal aortic segment so when my graft is in place it's able to lay flat and the uh, graft legs will splay around that distal aorta. So I'm going to sew that right now with a piece of uh, Gore-Tex suture and then we'll, uh, we'll go on and do our proximal anastomosis. The most common technique for doing an over sewing of a blood vessel is to do a running horizontal mattress. So we'll go in, we'll tie off this first bite. We don't need to overdo that. Ooh, that's some nasty tissue. That's a good example of if you only sew plaque, what happens? That pulls through. Let's get back down here. 
Okay, so now we're going to over sew that distal piece of aorta. They can always edit if you give them an edit point. Mm -hmm. we'll come in here and we'll tie that off. We're going to tie back to that, so we only need a couple of knots in that just to hold it in place. And now we'll just run again, run a running horizontal mattress from one end to the other. There you go, thank you. Again, sometimes you just have to get this calcium out of the way or you can't get your suture to penetrate even with the diamond tip uh, calcium needles. So we'll do a running horizontal mattress. Get down to this end. follow over there. Then we're going to go back down just a whip stitch right over the top of that suture line. Just to close that off. So you run a running horizontal mat mat mattress in one direction and then a uh, whip stitch, simple stitch in the opposite direction and then tie off to your original suture. Yeah, just pull toward you. Yeah, there you go. And now we're ready to do our proximal anastomosis. Could you grab another suture over there? Or I can, yeah, either way. I think it's at 3 0 will be fine. So we've cut that and we're ready to go. That CV3. Okay, so now we've got a nice prepared bed for our graft. And what we're going to do, the technique I'm going to use is a parachute technique using a, a running suture. And to do this, we're going to start by laying the suture on the other side of the table. And then I'm going to go outside in on the graft at what I would call 9 o'clock. So 6 o'clock is far away, 12 o'clock is up here, 9 o'clock is here, 3 o'clock is here, as if we were looking at a clock face toward the head of the table. So if I go outside in essentially at 9 o'clock, I take the same needle and I'm going to go inside out on the aorta at 9 o'clock. That's going to require a backhand stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and go backhand here. And I want to be sure to pick that up underneath this suture loop. All right, so the suture needs to stay on the other side of the field completely. All right, if you can find a tag, we could tag that over there with any kind of hemostat. Just any kind of clamp would be great. Okay. And then if you would, just kind of hold this graft like that and follow right here. And now we're going to reach in like this and we're going to go outside in on the graft. I'm going to come all the way to the top. And now I should be able to sew with a forehand bite right up here. Stick it in, we'll take it out all the way to the top. And now we'll go down and get the graft outside in. And after three bites, usually, particularly with Gore-Tex, it's probably about time to pull up, otherwise we will not be able to parachute it. And again, it's important to kind of keep track of what your clock face looks like. This is now about seven o'clock on the clock face on the aorta. And you may be able to single bite right on across to your graft. And again, rather than pulling on the stitch to get to the graft, you use your left hand to impale the uh, graft with the needle. That 
little bit of adventitia out of there. If you'll just follow like right there, that'll be great. And we just go right across. And you can see this, the, the assistant is able to set this up where it's just about foolproof. We just sew right across that back wall. And then once we get over here, another couple of bites. Usually these last couple of bites you have to double bite, otherwise you'll be, uh, otherwise you'll be uh, tearing the artery. We just come right there. And just come right toward you, perfect. We'll come back out on the artery here, and now we'll switch that tag off of here. And we'll put this tag here with a little bit of uh, tension on it. Now we can follow right there. And now we just start back at 9 o'clock. And some of you may object to sewing outside in. This is an artery that's already been endarterectomized. So it's not as though we can significantly hurt the uh, blood vessel. And now we just go right across that front wall. Couple more bites. And right there, we got one more bite and then we'll Take our uh, so that's a very very straightforward way to do a proximal anastomosis sewing toward yourself from the left side of the table. The sutures are crossed at the end. We tie that down, and we've completed that proximal anastomosis. We would then take the clamp off, lift the graft up, take a look, make sure we're hemostatic on the back wall, and we're ready to go with our distal part of our neck. Here we've got the aorta. Here's our common iliac artery. So we're going to come over here and dissect out that common iliac before its bifurcation, and then we'll transect the common iliac artery. I usually transect it like a slight bit of a diagonal because it does allow me to uh, see into that orifice of the artery with a little more clarity, and it's easier to sew. So there's my target vessel downstream, and I want to sew this branch to that. So I'll just take this and transect it, and that's, we're ready to go. All right. So again, I'm going to use that same technique I used before. I want to start away from myself, and I'm going to go outside in at approximately 9 o'clock on the graft. And we're going to put a tag on the other end of the graft on the opposite side of the table. Give it about right there. Yeah, you can just let it hang. It'll be all right. Yeah, Just follow right there. Okay, so my first bite is at 9 o'clock, which is directly away from me. And that therefore requires a backhand bite. So I go right in here, backhand. There you go. And I can pick up that needle, reload it. I can go right up to the top. And now I'll go right over outside in on my graft. Pick it up. I'll go all the way to the top. There you go. And now we just, I don't need a backhand on that next bite. I can go outside in, inside out, outside in. And I don't know if you can see that or not. 
Is that too dark on the screen? I don't know. Seems like it's dark. You said it's good. See now we're just going to run right across that back wall. Sometimes there's a little plaque you just have to excise it. And if there's any significant separation just go ahead and double bite it. Don't make it hard. And I sew right toward myself and then I can tag that. Yeah, I got to go one more. Sorry I need to go one more bite here and just finish that off on the outside. Yeah, there you go. Now we can tag that. Just put gravity there. And now we just sew across the front wall. We just come in here, get the front wall, get a good bite, come back up to the graft. And again, I'm sewing outside in, but I don't really think that makes any difference at all. It allows us to uh, see that suture line just really nice. You just come right across here and again if it has a little leak in it it's not a big problem you just put a little extra patching stitch that's there again this is all forehand so I'm in a very good position in terms of my body positioning it's easy for me I'm sewing right toward myself I take my needle off back flush both directions tie down and then in a matter of a relatively short period of time, we have a good anastomosis down to that common iliac. And I think this is just a great uh, simple technique for a, a single anastomosis. Again, start far away, outside in on the graph, work the back wall.